Welcome to Tartarian Tales 59, and this one is a cool one. Another one from the Rumsey Collection, where it is a great description. I believe it's from an atlas from around 1721, but it is an incredible description of Great Tartaria in Grand Tartary, and it has a lot of cool details that I've never heard before. It's got a kind of a geographical section, which is interesting, a political section, which is interesting, and a lot more. I think you all will like it. In the last Tartarian translations, kind of this was from the same batch and the same little uh, bout of research and diving. So they go together pretty nicely. I've got some cool artwork from some maps, some close-ups of some maps, some different artworks like this of different areas. And again, this will probably provide you all with more little things to look up. I always hear something in these uh, readings and then I dive a little deeper into a certain town or a city and then try to find more and then keep kind of looking and then see what happens there now on Google Earth and all these kind of things. There's a lot of different methods of trying to unravel all of this stuff and whatever it is we just uh, you know I'm just reading someone else's writing so I'm not claiming anything to be true. A lot of theory enwrapped in what I think in the different parts that I will uh, kind of chime in on as I read this. It's basically two pages, but it's big. A lot of girthy pages. And so uh, enjoy. Sit back and enjoy. I'll chime in again, and uh, let's see what happens here. I think you all will enjoy this one. Great Tartary is so called to distinguish it from Little Tartary in Europe. Under the name of Great Tartary was formerly comprehended not only all that part of Muscovite Asia already described, but all the countries south to the frontiers of Persia, the dominions of the Mughal, India, and China, and from the river Don or Tanais to the East Sea that divides the lands of Jefo and Japan from the continent of Asia. But the more ancient name was that of Scythia, divided into Scythia on this side and on the other side the mountain Emaus, part of the same ridge of mountains which Ides has described as above, in which they extended from Lat latitude 40 to the frozen ocean over against Nova Zembla. For the subdivisions of ancient Scythia we refer to Solarius and others who treat of ancient geography. Historians and geographers did formerly give very fabulous representations of this country and of their grand cham. Authors are divided about the origin and history of the Tartars. Some derive the name from the word Tatari, which in Syriac and Hebrew signifies a remnant as if they were descended from the ten tribes of Israel, carried away by Salmanasser. Others from a river in a country named Tatar, which Burgomaster Witsen takes to be the river Kwantung on the frontiers of China, where it falls into the river Amur. But the most probable signification of the name is invaders or robbers, in that they were at first composed of several nations who shook off the yoke of their tyrant, and joining together for common liberty were called Tartars, by those whom they resisted or invaded. Their name came to be first known and formidable in Europe about I-168, when they subdued part of Muscovy and settled in the Torica Chersonesis, now the Krim, Crimea. They are said to have been oppressed by the king of Tenduk, whom they defeated and settled their leader, Genghis Chan, upon the throne about I-202. These authors make the great Tamerlane his fifth successor and a prince of the blood royal. The best account we have of him is his history written by Mr. Sanction, dedicated to Louis XIV and published by his authority at Paris in I-677. He wrote it from the memoirs of al Hassan, a famous Arabian, who attended that prince in all his expeditions and was his historian. He makes him son, of, son to Og, king of Zagatai, the ancient Parthia, says he was born Anno Christi I-335, and that his name signified celestial grace, whereas others derive it from Timur, which signifies iron, because he was always in war, and Lenk, which signifies the lame, because he was born with a weakness in one leg. He discovered a greatness of soul from his infancy, upon which his father had him instructed by the best masters of all faculties in those days, and he was particularly well versed in astronomy, astrology, and the Zoroastrian divinity. He exceeded all the youth of his time in military exercises, 
so that he was the delight of mankind. His father, growing old, resigned him the government and appointed two of his greatest and albeit low, al blessed lords to his counselors till he came of age, being at peace with his neighbors in the beginning of his reign. He, apply, he applied himself to his studies and devotion, and by his mildness and affability gained the hearts of all his subjects so that they regarded him as their common father. He was very religious, believed in one God, the creator of all things, gave everyone liberty, who believed the like, to worship him in their own way, but was a mortal enemy to idolatry. He very much favored the Christians, so that according to this historian, he wanted nothing of a Christian but, a, but the name, and most of his great exploits were owing to the conduct of Aksala, a Christian, originally a Genoese, and bred up with him from his youth. Tamerlane was very beautiful and majestic and pretended to be descended from Samson, which made him the more respected by his subjects and dreaded by his neighbors. His first war was the, with the Muscovites, who invaded Kassan and Astrakhan and pillaged his frontiers. He commanded his army in person, defeated them in a great battle, forced them to sue for peace and pay him tribute. This raised his character so much that the great Cham, his uncle by the father's side, gave him his daughter and heiress and appointed him successor. After this, by order of his uncle and in conjunction with his troops, he prepared to invade the emperor of China, during which expedi expedition he fell sick, which gave an opportunity to some great Tartar lords to form a plot against his succession on pretense that he was a Parthian, and that it was below the dignity of the Tartars to be governed by a foreigner. Accordingly, they broke out into a rebellion under Calix, one of their chief nobles, which obliged Tamerlane to return. He fought the rebels, and after a great and bloody battle, wherein he was dismounted and in danger of his life, he was seasonably rescued by his Christian general, Aksala, who rooted the enemy and took their general that was afterwards beheaded with 200 of the chief rebels, which put an end to the rebellion. After this victory, he marched against China, defeated and took their king with two of his confederates, who, expecting to be put to death by the conqueror, according to the barbarous custom of their own country, he generously restored them to their thrones on condition of becoming tributaries and paying the charges of the war. They gave him hostages of the royal blood for performing the treaty, and the river Kwantung was established as the border of the two empires. He transported the chief of the conquered Chinese into his own country and sent Parthians in their steed in their instead to keep the subdued provinces in obedience. After this victory, he returned with his queen, who attended him all the while, to his father-in-law, who met him at a good distance from his capital, and would have alighted from his horse to receive and embrace him as his sovereign. But Tamerlane would not admit of it, and on the contrary, alighted from his own horse and paid all the homage and respect to the old cham that was due from a subject, which more and more endeared Tamerlane to the Tartars. Very interesting. His next expedition was against Bajazet, the Sultan of the Turks, at the desire of the Greek Emperor Paleologus, whom Bajazet had besieged in Constantinople. Axala, who was related to that emperor, commanded in chief under Tamerlane, and Bajazet, hearing of his march, raised the siege, encountered Tamerlane in a plain near the Euxine Sea, but was defeated and taken prisoner by Axala. Though the victory was chiefly owing to Tamerlane's own conduct and courage, who had a horse killed under him and was wounded with a lance, our author says that in this great victory the Turks had 60,000 men killed and Tamerlane 20,000. One of his prisoners was the despot of Servia, who being a Christian, Tamerlane treated him civilly, yet reproached him for taking arms against the Christians, but being persuaded that he did it not out of affection to Bajazet, but to save his own dominions, he gave, his, he gave him his liberty. Tamerlane ordered Bajazet's two sons to be treated like prisoners of quality and sent them at length to the emperor of Constantinople for their education. And after solemn thanks to God for putting so great an enemy of himself and all mankind into his hands, he ordered Bajazet, who raved like a man in despair, wished for death, and answered him haughtily to be shut up in an iron cage and made use of it as a footstool on solemn occasions when he mounted his horse. Upon this victory, all the Asiatic provinces 
formerly conquered by the Turks, submitted to Tamerlane, and he was congratulated by a solemn embassy of nobles from the Greek emperor, who submitted himself and his empire as homagers for having so seasonably rescued him from Bajazet's fury, but Tamerlane restored him generously to the full possession of his empire, which was such unexpected tidings of joy to the emperor that he went in person to Bursa to thank him, and Tamerlane returned with him incognito to Constantinople, where the emperor made him magnificent presents and swore a perpetual alliance with him. This is all a very awesomely in-depth uh, story that I'd like to even go a little deeper in, but wow, let's keep going here. After this, Tamerlane made war upon the Sultan of Egypt for assisting Bajazet in being joined by 10,000 of the Greek emperor's best horse conquered Syria, India, Egypt, and the greatest part of Africa, and in his return visited Jerusalem, paid his devotions at our Savior's sepulchre, and subdued Persia. He returned with great triumph to his own country, and then to Tartary, where he had quiet possession of the empire after his uncle's death, and was joyfully received by his empress, who had borne him a son during his absence. As he was on an expedition to subdue the empire of Greece, the new emperor of which had made a league with the Turks, he was taken sick, which obliged him to return to his capital, where on his deathbed he received the news of Axala's victories, sent for the prince his son, gave him excellent advice, recommended him to Axala's care, and soon after died, resigning his soul with great submission into the hands of God, to whom he ascribed all his victories. He took particularly delight in reading the history of our Savior and his miracles. He died in the 66th year of his age, A.C. I-405. Mr. Sanctian says, He far surpassed Caesar and Alexander, had all their great virtues and none of their vices, and extended his conquest further than either of them. The great Maurice of Nassau, Prince of Orange, always carried his history in his pocket, and preferred it to Caesar's commentaries and Xenophon's Cyropedia as a more proper model for great generals and princes. al Hassent says he was succeeded by Centracio, his eldest son, but Latracio, the younger, rebelled and carried the sovereignty, which ruined the grandeur of the family in the greatest empire then on earth. We have little certainty about his other successors, but Alan, one of them, is said to have turned Christian some derive the great mogul from a third son of Tamerlane, but of that in its place. Upon the whole, what is said by ancient historians of the great Chams of Tartary must either be referred to Tamerlane and his predecessors, or with some qualifications to the Chams of Zagate or Tanguth, for there has been no such prince as the great Cham of Tartary, properly speaking, in Asia for many years. And he has been not totally eradicated because people still know the name you can still see the name but his story is not nearly as popularized and hollywoodized and importantized as um, those of caesar and the other ones who were more decadent very interesting that this guy tamerlane was seemed to be pretty pure in his conquers so he was just a master conqueror or something but wow very cool so now we're going to keep going into the geography of Tartary. The Atlas Hor Historique, which is this, this book that this is from, divides Great Tartary into 25 parts, but many of them are already described in Muscovite Asia, and some of the rest belong to the Empire of China, which we refer to their pro proper place. The country in which the Tartars are now properly sovereigns extends almost from the Volga on the west to the Indian Sea on the east. Tis bounded by Muscovite Asia on the north, the Caspian Sea, the Mughals' dominions, and those of China on the south, but is much contracted to what it was formerly in breadth, and divided into so many hordes and clans under petty princes, for the most part, that they make nothing of their ancient figure. Tis divided into the territories of Euphimsi, Kalmuk Tartars, etc., Independent Tartary, Western Tartary, and Eastern Tartary, the last of which belongs to the Chinese, and each of these have their subdivisions under peculiar princes, but none of our maps are distinct as to their boundaries. We shall begin at the west and take them east as they lie in the map. The Euphimsi Tartars lie east from the Volga and are curbed by Muscovite garrisons on the northeast and west by the Nagay Tatars, subject to the Muscovites. 
On the south-southeast from the Euphimsi lie the Baskerzi Tartars, curbed likewise by Muscovite garrisons. East from them lie the Kalmuks and other hordes, as far as the river Obi, who are also bridled by Muscovite garrisons. The Tsar makes them yearly presents to prevent their incursions into his dominions, and because of the men and horse which they are obliged to furnish him with on occasion. They are very troublesome to the neighboring Tartars, and were particularly so to the Nagaeans, till the Muscovites furnish the latter with cannon and other firearms. Their chief champ pretends to be descended from Tamerlane, and is so powerful that both the Muscovites and Uzbek Tartars court his friendship. Some say he is always clad in white and served in gold plate. His subjects live in movable tenants and roam about with their, their flocks of cattle. The river Jayak runs through part of their country, falls into the Caspian Sea at latitude 45, longitude 85, and is so well stored with fish, especially sturgeon, that the inhabitants easily catch them on the banks with hooks fastened to the ends of poles. The river is large and the country on both sides abounds with wood, grass, herbs, and wild fruit trees. There are many caves on these coasts of the Caspian Sea, frequented by multitudes of swans that cast their feathers every midsummer, of which in their skins the Russians make great profit. There are several other wandering clans on the east side of this river in the northeast of the Caspian Sea who are valiant, have princes of their own, but the country is barren and the people miserably poor live in wretched huts on horse flesh and mare's milk, and what they can plunder from their neighbors. So they sometimes put themselves under the protection of the Persians, and at other times under the Tsar. They are for the most part Mohammedans, and though governed by particular lords, they choose one to govern the whole community, whom they call Shem Kal, upon whose death all those lords meet, sit down in a circle, into which a priest throws a golden apple, and he that is first touched by it is appointed successor. The Kalmuks in general are divided into black, white, brown, and fugitives, and inhabit chiefly betwixt the Caspian Sea in longitude 85 and betwixt latitude 40 and 50. Now, out of a lot of the sources that I've read, this one for some reason seems like it combines the most of them in a way that's a little more confident of itself than the other ones, and a little less propagandized than all the other ones that I've read which is a very interesting thing to take into consideration because the other ones always kind of talk about the Tartars as just the horse flesh eating barbarians. This one says that that is only certain parts and very small parts and that most of them were very royal and greater than Caesar and all of them. So, hmm. On the southeast of the Caspian Sea lie those called Turkumans and Uzbek Tartars, whose country was part of Persia on the west the Kalmuks in Turkestan on the east, and part of the Mughals' dominions on the south. Some include this country in independent Tartary and make Zagate the hereditary dominions of the great Tamerlane, the western part of it. He himself extended his country as far north as latitude 50 and longitude 60. He erected a pillar with the date of his expeditions this way. I wonder where that is. What was his country is reckoned the best inhabited part of Tartary, and has a great trade with Persia. The inhabitants are the most civil and cunning of the western Tartars, have been sometimes subject and sometimes enemies to the Persians, and been at war with the Indians and Chinese. They have excellent mana, which they sell to the Chinese, and have silk in exchange, which they sell to the Muscovites. Sir John Chardon says, they are called Uzbeks, which signifies a hundred lords, because of the many principalities into which their country is divided. He was invited by an ambassador of one of their princes at Ipsahan to his master's court at Balki, where he promised him good entertainment and vent for his, biz for his merchandise. But Sir John, being informed by the greatest merchants at Ipsahan that several Armenian merchants had been murdered and plundered there, notwithstanding their passports, he did not comply with the invitation. Interesting. Passports. He says the ambassador and his retinue were intolerably ragged and nasty, looked like highwaymen, and lived like beasts. They were about four inches lower than Europeans, but more bulky in proportion, with red large square faces, flat noses, and little eyes, and so like the Chinese that he believes they were of the same origin. 
They are so zealous for Omar, who made them first Mohammedans, that they hate the Persians who follow Ali, and commonly say the Jews ride to hell on the Persians' backs. Tis usual for them, when they travel to Persia, to bind themselves by oath, to kill any one that curses Omar, and they should die for it. They perform it accordingly, and thus the train of one of their ambassadors was all cut off at Ipsahan, and ever since, when any of them come thither, proclamation is published by sound of trumpet, forbidding anyone to curse Omar so loud as the Uzbeks may hear it. Sanson, the missionary, says they are formidable enemies to the Persians, whose country they invaded in his time. They have swift, swift indefatigable pads, and carry but little provisions, for they eat their baggage horses raw, and when they are overtaken with thirst in the deserts, prick their necks and suck their blood, so that the Persians, who live more luxuriously, are not able to pursue them through the scorching deserts. The chief places here are, 1. Samarkand, lat latitude, 44, latitude 40, longitude 66. Ptolemy calls it Marakanda, and Strabo Parakanda. Bessus, one of Darius's murderers, was seized here and delivered to Alexander, who put him to death. T'was in this place where he also cut off his friend Clytus, who saved him at the Battle of Granicus. Spitamenes held it out some time against the Macedonians and fled hence to Bactria. T'was the place of the birth, death, and seat of the great Tamerlane, who enriched it with the spoils of the East and made it a magnificent city, but tis now much decayed. It has still an academy which he founded and is highly esteemed by the Mohammedans. Avicenna, the philosopher, is said to have been born here in 880. It was a great mart for some ages betwixt the Indians and Roman subjects. Interesting how that 880 did not have an eye in front of it. And uh, yeah, that thousand years. Very interesting. Bokhara. Oh wait, I'm sorry. It was born here. In Avicenna, the philosopher, is said to have been born here in 880. It was a great mart for some ages betwixt the Indians and Roman subjects. And that was Samarkand. Bokhara, number two, on the river Oxus, 70 miles southwest of Samarkand, tis now the capital of the Uzbeks, was formerly encompassed with an earthen wall and divided into three parts. Two were the kings, and the third was for merchants and markets of every sort. Most of the houses were of earth when Jenkinson was here, but they had many houses, temples, and monuments of stone, with baths sumptuously and artificially built and gilt. The, prince re, re, the prince's revenue is but small, arising from the tenth of what's fold and sold in the city. But yet once a year the place is much frequented by merchants from Persia, Russia, etc. Tis the seat of a metropolitan who dis, deposes the king at pleasure. Jenkinson says one of them in his time murdered the prince by night in his chamber because he loved the Christians. <laughs> 3. Balki or Balch 120 miles southeast from Bokhara is also a town of trade in the residence of a prince to whose court Sir John Chardon was invited. 4. Erkin, 210 miles northeast of Samarkand is the residence of the Kalmuk's prince. Turkestan or Tokharistan lies south and southeast from Zagate. Herbert makes it the original country of the Turks, the posterity of Togema, the son of Gamor, who was shut up in these parts by Alexander the Great and made no appearance till the long wars betwixt the Emperor Heraclius and Shofros the Persian. It has old Cathay and sandy deserts on the west. Eusebius says that in his time it was well governed and disallowed of idolatry, which some ascribe to the Jews that mixed with them and others to the preaching of the apostles St. Thomas and St. Andrew. It had then many towns of note, and some make the kingdoms of little and great Tibet, Kaskar, etc., with capitals of their own names, parts of this country, which they say produces corn, wine, flax, hemp, cotton, excellent rhubarb, jasper, and other precious stones. But Ides makes the present name Bulgaria in Zagate, Kabul. East, south, and southeast from hence lie the Mongols, or Mongolian Tartars, as far as East Tartary, divided into many hordes or clans. They possess a vast tract of land and are under many princes, whose jurisdictions are not well distinguished in our maps, but there are three of them who seem to be the chief. Ides says that in his time these three were brothers, and that the people were supposed to be of the race of Gog and Magog. 
The eldest brother was the Kutugd, or high priest of the nation. His residence was at Kudak, near the head of the river Salinga, latitude 43, longitude 95. We should try to find that. This is supposed to be the vicar of the great Lama, or Tartar prince, in idol, of whom authors have told such strange stories. According to some, he has his residence in the fortress of Bitalak, near Barantola, in the kingdom of Tangut, betwixt the great sandy desert, the kingdom of Tibet, and frontiers of the Mughals' country, latitude 36, longitude 95. He is worshipped like a deity by the Mongolians and other Tartars, who send for his blessing from the remotest parts. Athanasius Kurt Kircher, our buddy, the Jesuit but amazing artist, and others say the greatest Tartar princes and lords esteem themselves happy if by rich presents they can obtain some of his excrements, dried, which they put into a gold box and carry about their necks as a preservative against all calamities and sometimes mix his ex excrements with water with their medicines. They are made to believe he never dies, but renews his age like the moon. Interesting. Renews his age like the moon. I've always thought that's what an eclipse was, a renewal, a revival. Interesting. I'm going to start that again. They are made to believe he never dies, but renews his age like the moon, and the lamas or priests about him carry on the cheat by having always in readiness one as like him as they can. Bury the Lama secretly when he dies, and set up the other in his steed. They keep him in a secret part of his palace, which is adorned with gold, silver, and precious stones, and enlightened by costly lamps. He sits on a rich throne to receive adoration, but no man is suffered to come very near him. Kercher says that in I-629, when the chief monarch of the Tartars conquered China, his Tartar subjects would, need, would needs have him go and worship this idol. But Father Adams, a Christian who was intimate with that prince, dissuaded him from it, so that the Lama was only admitted to the garden of his palace at Peking, where he received the usual presents, but the emperor would not see or pay him adoration, which pleased the Chinese, who cursed the Lama, and charged him with being the author of all their calamities, instead of giving them his blessing. The inferior Lamas who attend him have a sort of loose habits of red or yellow, much of the same fashion with those in which the apostles are usually painted, and kind of like Tibetans. That's interesting again. That's what Tibetans nowadays have, that same color, the loose bits of red or yellow. The Magulian, Maguyalans thinks that this proceeds from an account in the Chinese chronicles that one Tamo, an excellent man, came and taught them a holy law and did many miracles among them. Oh, there we go. During the reign of the family of Han, that was contemporary with our Savior, but not meeting with the desired success, he returned to India. I've heard stuff like that before, too, from other sources. This is supposed to have been the Apostle St. Thomas, who is said to have preached in those parts, and there are still a great many Christians in the east parts of Asia who call themselves by his name. This Lama is in the language of the country named Prestigiani, i.e. apostolic, which Europeans not understanding called him Predijani, and afterwards Prester Jean, whom by mistake the Portuguese missionaries took for the emperor of Abyssinia, because that prince is a Christian, and has a cross always carried before him, and that upon enquiry they could hear of no such Christian prince in East India where they supposed him to have lived. Father Avril and others take the Lama to be the elective successor of Prestigiani, who was the patriarch of the Christians in Tartary, and invested also with the temporal power of a prince that his chief residence was in Indistan or Great India, now the Mughals' country, where he defeated the Tartars sent against him by the Great Cham, according to St. Anthony's history. Tom III and Paulus Venetus, who having been long at the court of the Great Cham, places the Lama in Tenduk, alias Tangud, much the same where Ides now places him. But the country being overrun with paganism, the Tartars have set up their Lama in his stead. The name signifies a cross, and those who adore this idol still wear crosses about them, which they preserve with great care. <sighs> this Lama now has only the superintendency of religion, and his deputy manages all temporal affairs. This deputy was the eldest of the three brothers who, Ides says, 
governed the Mongolians in chief and with his second brother put himself under protection of the emperor of China against the chief prince of the Kalmuks by whom they suffered much in I-688 and I-689. But their third brother robbed and plundered wherever any booty was to be had, made incursions even to the Chinese wall, and shared his prey with the neighboring Tartar hordes to keep them firm in their allegiance to him. These Mongolians do for most part keep fair with the Muscovites, but hate the Bogdoi, or Eastern Tartars, ever since they conquered China and united with that empire, in the description of which we shall give an account of them. Wow, so very insightful, so much packed into this, my god. This, this whole history, all of the things, all of the things that this, these people built, I and mean, we always hear things about that Alexander the Great and Caesar and all them, how their empires were so huge. You see it in so many Hollywood movies. But how big was Tamerlane's when he conquered all of that? And he had the power to conquer all that. It's almost surprising that Hollywood and things would leave this guy out of history because it's right up their alley with their superhero stories and their like conqueror stories and all these different things. I wonder if it's because of his good nature, he didn't have those vices, if he did something very spectacular that they are trying to hide. Whereas all these other ones kind of tried to conquer the world or they, they did all these amazing things but they were like decadent and they killed all these other people and they killed all the, their brothers and the other family, all, the, all this stuff, all this drama. What if the one story they left out was the one that had to do with everything, that had to do with so much of the past and connected all the ancient dots, or many of the ancient dots that we need connected. And maybe he was Tamerlane in just this, this different, uh, the Tartaries, this, this era of Tartarian control of the world, maybe that also connected with America and that's what they're trying to hide. Or that's again what they eviscerated because it's just a can to think that these people didn't make it over to America during the times when they were doing all these things and traveling everywhere is absolutely impossible. They conquered it all. They knew it all existed. They went all over the place. They traveled. They traded with everyone. I'm sure Tamerlane's name was known all over the place, just as leaders are known all over the world today. It seems like they were all known. These maps were here. People could go, they could travel, they could see these places. They were all connected in ways that we can't even fathom because they've told us so many times that it was never like this and that it's just been weak and weak past and we are the strongest and smartest and population's just gradually gotten up to this point today with a steady increase instead of just the rise and fall that it probably is. It's probably been billions many times over. God knows what happened to the resets in between. That's what we have to solve and prevent. And I hope that we can get back by acknowledging this stuff. And I hope more and more history just keeps uniting because a lot of people say it's a waste of time, but it really isn't. When you realize that the people that are in control of a lot of the knowledge is, have an evil agenda, a communist, a racing of all that is great, a godless, hate-filled, nasty, death dominant agenda then you you realize that what they are trying what those same people took from us and eradicated in our history is very important and necessary and it has to be discovered because they felt it necessary to take it away from us we must have it back we must gain the access to it gain the knowledge and share it with the whole world because that's exactly what the evil forces that have taken over and ruined this place have just would hate to have happen. So we need to take our power of humanity and our full potential back. It's not in robotics and nanotech crap. That nonsense has to end. We were given all of the tools we need to have a beautiful, brilliant existence in all of our perfect natures, far beyond our realm, within this realm, in the sea, everywhere, in the hills, in the fields, in the forests, in the jungles, everywhere. It's all there for us. We have to take advantage of it and stay pure and stay in touch with nature and really discover the mysteries of this world. Be it a flat earth, be it a spherical, massive earth, whatever it is, it's what we're not told. Whatever our history is, it's what we're not told and we need to keep going, figuring it out. And I love you all for adding insight in the comments and continuing to check this stuff out and adding to the overall discoveries that we are all making together as a great awesome community so 
Bless you all. Have a good one.